Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm David Getches, and I'm the dean here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Schultz Lecture in Energy. Uh, this series of lectures is made possible by a generous endowment provided by John and Cynthia Schultz, and we're grateful to them and regret that they're out of state tonight and unable to attend. We're pleased however, to have with us their daughter and son-in-law and grandson, uh, David and Cynthia Howard and Michael Howard. Thank you. And uh, we also thank Heidi Horton of the Natural Resources Law Center for her organizational work and recognize Center Director Mark Squalacci. Also here is uh, Lakshman Guruswamy, Director of our Center for Energy and Environmental Security. And I want to recognize especially Dean Rob Davis of the College of Engineering and Applied Science, who's with us. And Christina Johnson, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> it's good Dr. to Dr. Johnson has deep roots here in Colorado, a native daughter and one of seven children. She grew up in a family of engineers, a father, and a grandfather in whose steps she followed. And it may not have occurred to her as a girl that the profession was male dominated. She won the high school science fair and eventually went on to be one of the top women in science. As a leading professional and educator, her encouragement of inclusiveness in professions where women have been scarce has been powerful. She said, quote, simply put, unless we bring more women and minorities into science and engineering fields, we will not have the intellectual capital to address the major economic, environmental, health, and security issues facing our nation. Developing our underutilized human resources can be our competitive advantage. Christina Johnson received her BS and MS degrees at Stanford and completed her doctorate there in 1984. From 1983 to 1985, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Pure and Applied Physics at Trinity College in Dublin. She joined the CU faculty in the College of Engineering where she spent 14 years. Then she became Dean of Engineering at Duke and later Provost at Johns Hopkins. Her awards, honors, and articles are numerous. Dr. Johnson is an expert in liquid crystal electro-optics, and her best-known research involves smart pixel arrays. And besides her scholarly achievements, she's an entrepreneur, starting dozens of companies and putting engineering ideas to work. President Obama appointed Dr. Johnson to be Undersecretary of the Department of Energy in 2009, and she served in that post until this fall. The Undersecretary is responsible for diverse technological activities of the vast agency, including promoting U.S. energy efficiency and coordinating research with commercial development and use. Among other things, the agency this year has been administering some $57 million in grants for small businesses pursuing commercialization of clean energy technology. At DOE, Christina found it natural to promote energy conservation, saying that she was, quote, reared on waste not, want not. <laughs> One of Christina Johnson's signature ideas is finding fuller potential for hydroelectric generation, pointing out that most dams lack generating facilities and the potential for producing more power from those facilities is huge. Tonight, Christina Johnson speaks on addressing the nation's energy challenges. There are indeed few issues more important to the United States and to the well-being of the world than energy and climate. Much of the needed technology is ready and awaits the opportunity to address these problems, but 
public policy constrains the ability of experts to focus technology on this most critical issue of our day. This is what drew Christina Johnson to government, and it's what draws so many of our students at the law school to be lawyers, hoping to be architects and advocates of the policy and legal frameworks that can inhibit or propel critical change. In the case of energy and climate, the stakes are no less than the fate of our society and our way of life. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Christina Johnson. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank Dean Getches for the opportunity to be home and to uh, come back and give a lecture at the University of Colorado. I really enjoyed the 14 years I was a professor here, and it's a pleasure to come back. And I'd also like to thank Heidi Horton and uh, Danielle and, and uh, Irene for making the arrangements. I know we had a few changes here and there, so thanks for your patience. Um, today, I'd like to talk about some of the analysis that we did in the Department of Energy in terms of trying to figure out how we would reach the administration's goals of reducing our petroleum consumption 18% by 2018 and also our greenhouse gas emissions 83% by 2050 and definitely took an engineering approach. So I was schooled well here at the uh, University of Colorado and learned how to th think about things from a cross-disciplinary systems perspective. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because actually the Department of Energy is much like a university. In fact, most institutions I've discovered really do mimic in some ways uh, the university. So I will be referring to that as we go through this. And I did want to say that I'm proud of being a former professor here as much as being former undersecretary. Um, so what's the urgency, I, I guess, uh, of this problem? And, and this is a, a photograph taken of Grinnell Glacier in Glacier National Park. And this was taken in, in 1938. And as we go through um, fast forward, you can see that over time, we've actually seen a rapid decrease of this particular glacier. In fact, by 2009, it's uh, almost not glacier size. So I'll go back for a minute. Um, so we've lost about half of our glaciers, uh, the named glaciers in Glacier National Park. And it's estimated in the next decade by the USGS that we'll lose the balance of them. So they'll be subglacier in size if they exist at all. So clearly we can see we don't have to go to the Himalayas to see glaciers melting. We have them right here in North America. So in response to this, my boss and my boss's boss, I mean, you know, we set some goals of, uh, you know, let's get after this, Secretary Chu and company, and let's see what we can do to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So I embarked about a year ago on um, looking at getting together, uh, first of all, building a team uh, in the Department of Energy. There's three pillars. There's, there's the... Uh, nuclear, the National Nuclear Safety Administration, so in sort of a stockpiled stewardship and all that, and then there's the basic science, and then there's energy, and that includes fossil energy and renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, nuclear energy, legacy management, environmental cleanup, and the uh, grid modernization. So it's about a $10 billion portfolio. And one of the great things about coming in at the beginning of an administration is you, you help to build the team and pick the team. And so we recruited uh, five assistant secretaries, uh, two members of the National Academy, uh, which is uh, terrific, and one, Jim Markowski, actually ran a coal-fired plant, so he knows about power at scale. And uh, Pete Miller, who is assistant secretary for nuclear energy, he had been a deputy director of Los Alamos and also a member of the National Academy. Uh, Pat Hoffman, who was a career person in the Office of Electricity Delivery and Reliability. Kathy Zoy, who had been CEO of a major not-for-profit in the energy efficiency and renewable areas. So and Ines Trier, who also had been a career person in environmental management. So we had a pretty uh, dynamic and diverse and very dedicated staff. And uh, I must say that you know, the, the joke about government is, from my perspective, not true that it's uh, good enough for government work because I think that may be true, but our standards were pretty, pretty high. And we also worked very hard. I think the average 
Uh, probably averaged uh, 18 hours a day, 6 a.m. to midnight, almost every day for 20 months and with the team. So we got to know each other very well. And we built a, essentially like a dean's cabinet. When I was provost at Hopkins, we had a dean's cabinet of all the deans. So I, I definitely view the assistant secretaries as deans. And one of the things that the deans and I recognized is that you know, if we look historically over the migration from a single primary source of energy, whether it be wood or coal to oil and gas, generally it'll take 80 to 100 years to, to look at this migration from 100% or 90% dependence down to 50%. So the urgency is by 2050 to see if we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. It means that we're going to have to migrate to a portfolio, a balanced portfolio, if you will, in about half that time which is one of the reasons why we say we need a portfolio, because we're not going to be able to switch from a petroleum or fossil fuel dominated energy culture to either nuclear or either renewables or uh, carbon capture and sequestration. So we will need a bit of everything. So that framed the conversation. Something else that framed the conversation, and, and this was an op-ed piece that appeared in the Wall Street Journal almost exactly a year ago. It was December 3rd, 29, and you can look it up. But it was an article by a professor at MIT, Richard Lester, and um, who's a very distinguished uh, academic. He said, what would it take to actually reach 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? And so some of the things that are cited in the article is that we would need to build five times the nuclear power plants by 2050. So we have about 100 nuclear reactors at 66 plants today. We'd have to increase that in 40 years by uh, 400, which would be about 10 a day, which is a little less but than we did at the heyday of the nuclear power um, industry in 1973. Then he went on to say that we would actually have to add nearly four times the amount of wind that we deployed last year. Last year we deployed between 9 and 10 gigawatts. We're looking at having to deploy uh, 30 uh, megawatts, excuse me, 30 gigawatts per year, every year for the next 40 years. We'd have to deploy 100 times the amount of solar that we did in 2008 every year for the next 40 years. We'd have to double the number of coal-fired power plants, and all of them would have to be carbon capture and sequestration. So if you look at this, you'd say, there's no way we can do this. So at the same time, we were starting to, in the Department of Energy, with the, the deans or the assistant secretaries, really explore these kinds of um, assumptions and see what would it really take. So what we came up with which is what I'm going to talk about today, is a uh, strategic technology energy plan, which would look at the following. If we took a portfolio approach, and we intentionally use a portfolio of technologies that exist now, so we don't have to discover anything new or heroic in order to make it happen. We take a long-term orientation, so we're looking at what would it take at 2050 to get to 83%, knowing that we may or may not hit the 42% reduction by 2030 or the 17% by 2020, but I think we will. Um, and we don't assume any offsets. What technologies would be required to be deployed at scale? So what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is uh, those results and how we got there. And, and then talk about some work that the Boston Consulting Group helped us with, which was to cost it out and to see how much would it really cost. And that's all within the scope of the study. What's not in the scope of the study are assumptions on the benefits to national security if we're not depending on importing 60-some uh, percent of our petroleum from outside of uh, the US, nor the uh, impact of the, um, on our health or on domestic job creation and global trade. That will be next steps of our STEP project. So starting out. Um, let me start with the results, and then we'll come back to how we got there. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, starting with 5.5 gigatons, uh, roughly emissions in 2010. We want to reduce it by 83%. So that's where um, the administration's goals would put us at. And we want to get to, uh, and we're roughly at about 80%. At the same time, we want to reduce the petroleum use by 18% by 2018. And if we continue, along the path of five approaches or levers that we call them, we probably end up with less than 10 quads of energy use out of 2050. And the color coding is that this is the reduction we'd have to make in the electrical generation in terms of CO2 emissions. So right now our electrical generation is about 70% from fossil fuels, about 20% from nuclear power, about 8% from renewables. 
And then this is the, uh, these are the emissions, about 2.2 gigatons in transportation. So we get to this decrease by decarbonizing the electrical sector. We decrease transportation, transportation by electrifying the light duty vehicle fleet and focusing biofuels on advanced fuels such as bio crude diesel as well as jet diesel and not focusing it so much on light duty vehicles. And uh, this is the reduction in our industry use, which is probably going to be one of the toughest nuts to crack. And then finally, this is a decrease in buildings. And uh, buildings actually have um, not so much energy, uh, I would say, CO2 emissions, but it is responsible for quite a lot of our, our energy use. So that's the plan that we achieve. Now, how do we get there? So if we were to look at the greenhouse gas emissions today of about five and a half gigatons, and if we were to look at the estimates of the Energy Information uh, Administration within the Department of Energy, on a business as usual, we'd probably grow that to over seven gigatons, maybe even more, by 2050. And yet what we're trying to accomplish is reducing it to somewhere around 1.3 gigatons. So this is without a doubt a heroic effort. But what I'd like to, to uh, advocate is that this is sort of an Apollo 13 moment. We've got all the technologies on the spaceship of Earth. Question is, how can we deploy it? We have 40 years instead of maybe, I don't know how many days, four days. So we've got some time. So we have to start particularly on a, on a path. And what's most important is that over this next, next decade, that we get to a point where we can deploy these technologies at scale and start to change the slope of decarbonizing electrical sector and electrifying the transportation sector. So this is how we get here in terms of creating a clean energy base load with nuclear and carbon capture and sequestration, increasing our renewable energy, uh, taking a big bite out of our transportation uh, emissions and our building and industry. So our strategic technology energy plan is really built around five levers. And as I mentioned before, it's decarbonizing the electrical sector, which gives us actually pretty much an even balance between renewable energy, fossil energy with carbon capture, storage, sequestration, or reuse, and nuclear energy out of 2050. Switching from fossil fuels to uh, electricity for heating and for personal <coughs> transportation. Increasing our energy efficiency and conservation, uh, we need to reduce our energy by 23 quads in order to flatline our mm -hmm. energy consumption. And this is in one place where um, Professor Lester and, and I agree, is that we do want to keep our consumption flat, and we can do that by energy efficiency. Now, in the STEP plan, traditionally, if you look at energy intensity decrease over the last 30 years or so, the U.S. has gone down by about minus 1.77% per year. In order to achieve this 23 quad reduction by 2050, we'd have to decrease that, we'd have to increase that decrease to about 2.3%. And, and I don't think that that's too um, outrageous, particularly considering the kinds of tools and the merging of our grid from, or our transformation of our grid from an analog to a digital uh, medium where we can apply enterprise software techniques in order to increase the efficiency of how we use, how we generate, transmit, and use uh, energy. So I'm quite uh, optimistic about that. We'll require a modern, secure, um, and flexible grid, which will mean supply side as well as demand side management. And then substituting biofuels for petroleum in our freight transportation, which means both heavy duty vehicle as well as our air transport. So if we start out uh, today, about 8% of our electricity is from re renewables, and that would be in uh, 20, obviously 2010. So that means that going to 2050, instead of increasing our renewable energy four times per year every year for the next 40 years, we actually are looking at increasing it by only a factor of four. So we would go from roughly 430 terawatt hours to about 18 160 terawatt hours, which means that renewable energy would be 31% of our energy portfolio. Now, if you think about that, it's 8% now, and it's growing fairly rapidly. Solar is uh, increasing depending on the year and the policies and wind, um, in clearly in the middle of double digits. Uh, where are we going to get this from? Well, part of where we're going to get this increase is actually from hydropower. 
So it turns out there's about 80,000 dams in the U.S., only 2,400 produce electricity. We could probably take out dams and working with it, we've had meetings with the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Interior, and we have a MOU with Department of Interior and Department of Energy to work together to figure out a way to manage both the environment as well as optimizing the grid. So one of the things that we did with the $36 billion um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act investment in energy is we took $30 million and we put up a solicitation towards um, hydropower plants. We did large hydropower and small hydropower, so-called, you know, run a river small would be around 10, 20, 30 megawatts, and large would be, you know, hundreds of, of megawatts together in multiple units. Actually, Boulder, Colorado, I did not review the proposals. That was somebody else that didn't, you know, did that, um, was the recipient of one of those grants where we replaced two of the Francis turbines that were installed in 1919, I think. So they've been running for almost, I think they've been running for 90 years, uh, with a right-sized turbine, a single unit, that was right-sized to the Boulder Creek, which has changed in its flow rate over the years because of population increase and water use. And it's actually generating 25,000 megawatt hours more, even with a small tur smaller turbine. We did a project in Robbinsville, North Carolina, where we had four units that were 22 megawatts each, and we're able to replace them. They're also Francis turbines. They're very robust, those Francis turbines. They were installed in the 1900s, early 1900s. They went from 22 megawatts to 27.5 megawatts, which is a 25% increase. And if you look at the payback, if you can increase your efficiency in hydro um, by over 20%, it's five to eight years to pay back. So we think that there's an enormous opportunity to look at all the projects in the country and to do upgrading of the efficiency and also look at more opportunities there. So I would say that in our plan, we could probably, well, I would say in our country, we could probably go from 8% to doubling that to maybe 16% of our electricity, but we're not as aggressive in the plan. The plan's pretty conservative. We're just increasing the percentage of uh, hydro from 8% to about 11 or 12%. Now, I must say, all electricity, electricity use will increase in our plan. We're looking at for going from four petawatt hours to six petawatt hours. That's just the historical rate. Again, what we used historical rates based on the last 30 years of 1% to 2% a year increase from now until 2050. That is a place where we differ from Professor Lester's. Um, he's looking at more of uh, doubling the amount of electricity use, which is why the difference in the number of power plants, et cetera. So we think that uh, about half of that 30%, excuse me, about a third of that 30% will come from hydro. The rest will come from wind, solar, biomass, and geothermal. And with the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we actually put the uh, solar and wind on a different trajectory so that we're planning to double the amount of solar and wind by 2013. And then the question is, what's going to ha happen afterwards? These are estimates by the um, Energy Information Administration. We think that with the proper policies, and I think I'm in the right place for thinking about policy, we could actually continue this on this particular slope instead of it leveling off. But that would mean that we would have to have a consistent set of policies that don't expire on a yearly basis or every few years and really set a goal that we're going to do this. And I think that that is uh, our challenge. It's not a technology challenge. Uh, so this is, again, if I haven't said enough about hydropower, let me just say that one of the other things that I think is needed in the country is storage. You know, we, we've heard a lot about storage. Storage is very important for variable sources because if you're uh, off-grid and you are um, on solar power and a cloud comes over, your amount of generation will drop by 80% pretty quickly within a few minutes. So, um, But we often don't think about large storage. And so the, the types of opportunities where this is a... Uh, a um, pumped hydro storage facility in uh, Winneka, I think Pennsylvania. What you do is that during the day, you pump water up to the storage when the demand is low, and then when the demand is high, then you spill it into the dam and you can actually increase your usage. So it's one way of um, increasing the amount of load, uh, power to meet the load demand. We're gonna talk a little bit about why that's so important uh, in the couple of upcoming slides. So nuclear power right now is about 20% of our electricity. I mentioned it's about 104 nuclear reactors at 66 power plants. Uh, in our plan, we would like to see that double uh, to about from 100 gigawatts to about 200 gigawatts from now until 2050, which means that if we do 
uh, continue licensing so-called generation three plus large uh, gen three plus reactors if we continue uprating and getting more efficiency out of the power plants many people don't know but in 1970 these power plants were not that efficient maybe less than 50 percent today they're approximately 90 percent efficient which is the difference between having to deploy 45 nuclear power plants or not so uh, huge uh, technological improvements there so we plan to uh, we have planned in our plan that there'll be some lifetime extensions. Not all the nuclear power plants will have a lifetime extension. There'll be about half of them extended to 60 years and another small percentage extended to 80 years. It also means that we're quite excited about the opportunity to do small modular reactors. So these would be nuclear reactors of a size of less than 300 megawatts where the foundry that you could build the nuclear vessel, pressure vessel in, could actually be built in the U.S. Right now, there is no large foundry in North America. The last one was in Canada 15 years ago. And these are the large foundries where you'd actually be able to build hydropower turbines or nuclear uh, pressure vessels. So this is a real problem for just manufacturing. So I think that one trend, and I don't want to draw too tight an analogy with information technology, but it might be a little bit like, you know, are we, are we in the day of going from mainframes to mini computers and PCs? Hard to say with regard to their small modular, but I do think small modular and hydro, small modular and nuclear, small modular and some of the other technologies is an interesting thing for us to, to look at. So if we do that, uh, if we were to increase the, the nuclear power plants and build about three or four a year starting in 2020, and about 240 terawatt hours would come from these small modular reactors, then we would look at uh, by 2050 about a third of our energy coming from nuclear. And then lastly, in terms of um, the decarbonizing the electrical sector, we're heavily investing in carbon capture and sequestration. Um, with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, I, I'm trying to remember, it's about $4 billion that we issued in grants to try and start the first generation of demonstrations at scale. And at scale means can you capture and store about a million tons of CO2 or more. So this is a picture from a plant in Mountaineer, West Virginia. I had the pleasure of, of being there. It's an AEP plant uh, with the governor and the senator Rockefeller to uh, open the particular slipstream takes 10% of the CO2 off of this plant and, and is sequestering it um, thousands of feet uh, into the ground. So we'll see what happens with this particular uh, facility as we monitor that going forward. So our plan would be out at about 2050, about half of the plants would be operating with either um, post-combustion sequestration or would be operating in a cleaner platform, whether that's an oxy burn or an IG, uh, integrated gasification combined cycle or something else where we would be able to capture the CO2 and sequester it. Now, you may think getting the 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is aggressive, which it is, but it also means you're still emitting 17%. And so the balance is, where would you put that 17%? Probably in industrial processing sector, maybe in some of the um, heavy-duty transport, if you can't offload it. So this is some of the balance and some of the robust conversations we had around this. I have to say that some of the, the greatest conversations I've had in the last 20 months was sitting around a table with people extremely knowledgeable in, in how to run a coal-fired plant, how to run a nuclear power plant, how to do renewables, how to do energy efficiency, and arguing and saying, well, we can do more than 30% renewables by 2050. Well, that's great because there are a lot of assumptions in here. They we're assuming that carbon capture and sequestration is going to work. We're assuming that no nuclear power uh, uh, disaster happens. We're assuming that renewable energy, we're not going to run out of some of the core basic materials and we'll be able to make it as cheap so that it is adopted not only in our country, but worldwide. If any of those assumptions fall apart, you're going to need the balance of these portfolios, so we need headroom. And so headroom is built into this. So step is not the definitive approach of how to reach the goals, but it is a path by which the market can now optimize. And I mentioned a little bit about the grid. We spent uh, about, we invested $4 billion on modernizing the grid, which means anywhere on the uh, supply side with digital transformers, phaser measuring units so that we can detect what is happening on the grid and we could predict the power outage that happened in August 2003, which took down electricity on the Northeast and cost us billions of dollars. Um, from that particular outage. 
as well as deploying the smart meters, the plug-in hybrid vehicle fleets, and doing experiments all around the, the country on what happens when you start to plug in a new appliance called an automobile. So we're pretty excited about the smart grid investment grants, and we're looking forward to using a more digital grid to, uh, for one thing, take advantage of the opportunities if we can do peak shaving, right? I mean, peak shaving is what we want to do everywhere. We want to peak shave in transportation. You don't want everybody trying to go to the University of Colorado at the same time to work, because then you get congestion. Well, the same thing happens in the grid. Uh, so what this study has shown here is that 25 of our distribution assets and 10% of our generation assets are needed less than 5% of the time. So that means that if we look at the peak here, which is where 25% and 10% of our costs are, that's needed only to service about 440 hours of electricity a year. So if we could figure out a way with either pump storage to do, uh, meet the load with the demand, the supply demand side, and shave that off, that would be tremendous savings in terms of the plants that we then don't have to build. So some of this comes from being able to do so-called um, demand side or autom automated demand response in your appliances. So here was an experiment that was done by PG&E back in 2007, which is to say that this was sort of the, as a function of time during the day, the low, lowest sort of in the wee hours of the morning, and then as the morning kicks on, the uh, demand increases. And then if you were able to in the afternoon when you want to turn on your air conditioner because it's hot out, if you're able to cycle down your refrigerator and do it on a cycle time so that you don't lose your perishable goods inside the refrigerator, they actually demonstrated that you could save about 20%. And 20% is huge because the greenhouse gas emissions from the electrical generation sector is about 1.9 gigatons. So 20% is roughly the equivalent of um, powering 40 million homes or taking 70 million cars off the road. So it's significant. This is something we need to get to, and this is one area where we really focused on with our smart grid investment grants. So now I'm going to switch from the decarbonizing the electrical sector to thinking about our transportation sector. So I think that uh, we all um, became uh, aware in a, in a very real way with the disaster and the tragedy that happened in April, April 28th, with the um, oil spill in the Gulf. And so depending on petroleum for such a huge percentage of our energy source is something that I think that we need to look at. If, if not for the environmental impact, the impact of sending 300 billion a year outside of the country in terms of our trade deficit. So let's see, what do we need to do in the transportation sector? Well, I say electrify the transportation sector. This plan calls for 100 million zero emission vehicles by 2030. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is. But if you think about most of uh, the CEOs, and this is a picture from the first battery that's coming off the line in a, one of the battery factories that we invested in, in Michigan, that will go into the Chevy Volt uh, with our, our secretary and, and the governor and other folks uh, here. If we were to look at what it would take to get to be 100 trillion, most manufacturers of cars, especially uh, CEOs from Europe, are saying that every single car made from 2020 on will be either, either a hybrid or an electric vehicle. Now, in the recession in the US, we purchase about 10 million cars a year. During good times, it's about 15 million cars a year. So in 2020, if we're purchasing 10 million cars a year, and everyone's going to be plug-in hybrid or an EV, chances are by 2030, they'll have 100 million uh, low emission vehicles that probably aren't exactly zero emission. Uh, so light duty vehicle fleets, of which there's 125 million cars in the US, accounts for 58% or almost 60% of our emissions. Work trucks and freight hauling is 20%. So the next biggest segment is 20%. Department of Energy has a very successful program even now, but it'll be even more successful in the future, to reduce the, the emissions uh, from work trucks by 50% and increase the efficiency um, in concert. 13% emission comes from air transportation. Now, it turns out that uh, one of the things that we invested heavily in, I think 400 million, was in biofuels. And I think one of the things that we learned, one of the takeaways from thinking about how we decarbonize the transportation sector is if you've got 13% of your emissions in, in air transport, you might not be able to, in the near future, electrify flight. Now, I was very impressed by the solar plane. 
Um, but in terms of carrying hundreds and hundreds of people and deploying that at scale by 2050, I would say another thing that we might think about is taking our biomass, which we have about a gigaton of, so we don't have enough to do the 240 million gallons that we consume a year in terms of our transport needs. But if we were to focus that gigaton on air transportation and heavy trucks, we could approach a significant fraction of that need. So one of our takeaways was probably don't look at biofuels for light duty vehicles, look at it for freight, haul, uh, freight and hauling. Um, the other part of that fraction could also be taken up by compressed national, natural gas, and that would be also very helpful. And this is the Green Hornet that was flying on uh, biofuels. And so right now we are testing, um, the Navy is testing the, about 1,000 gallons from SolarZyme uh, on a biofuel for uh, jet, jet fuels. So I think that we're making some progress here. Certainly we have a lot more progress to go, but that is um, a very exciting time for us right now in the transportation sector. The last one is, so we have generation, and then we have the end use sector. So we talked about transportation. Buildings, both commercial and residential, uh, account for about 40% of our, uh, 40 to 60, I think it's, excuse me, 60% of our energy consumption. And about half of that is in residential and half of that is in commercial. So we invested $5 billion in a weatherization of low-income homes. And what we found, and I've gone out to the homes, and I actually looked at furnaces that were installed in the 1950s and then got replaced by more efficient uh, furnaces. They're about 50% efficient 50 years ago. They're about 90% efficient today. So we found with about a $5,000 investment, we could actually in decrease the energy intensity in the homes by 30%, which is a significant amount. That's the good news. The other news is that, you know, our goal is to weatherize a million, a couple million homes. The building stock's 140 million homes, so this is a big challenge. And over the last 30 years, the Department of Energy has helped weatherize 6.3 million, but we're never going to get there by 2050 unless we think differently about how we do that deployment. So some of the things that we looked at doing, and we're in the process of trying to experiment, and I think one of the grants came to Colorado, which is um, the retrofit ramp up. So how do you, we took $400 million of the Recovery Act, and we said, let's think about other models uh, besides the traditional way of trying to weatherize homes. Uh, for example, um, people that deploy cable can do 200,000 homes a month. So what are they doing, and what's their logistics, and their, what is their actually supply chain approach? And so we put out a grant to see could people come up with clever ways of doing it. I think, I'm not sure, is anybody here from two techs in a truck? Uh, so did you get a grant? Did you get one of these grants? Yes, yes. Ah, great. I knew that. Very good. Excellent. We're very happy about that. Yeah. That's because you're very good, and we wrote a great proposal. And uh, so that was with great pleasure. So we're, but the other side of it, we're expecting a lot from you guys <laughs> in terms of showing us how we can get from 6 million homes over 30 years to 140 million homes over the next 40 years, but no pressure. So, <laughs> for once, the pressure's not on me. I love that. Okay. Um, so, what we're trying, to, what we've, I hope I've tried to show is that we put a lot of thinking into how we might reach these goals. Now you might say, what's it going to cost? And so this is a slide that, that I've shown. I'm going to actually skip this one to the next slide because I'm going to put numbers on it. Being an engineer, I like numbers. So here's one of the things that, that we discovered, and I, I think working with the Boston Consulting Group who did this analysis, um, you know, this is like any good startup. It's going to go negative and then it's going to go positive okay, if it's a good startup. So cumulative investment we need to make over the next 15 years is about a trillion dollars net of business as usual. In other words, business as usual, we're probably going to spend about 13 trillion on our energy, transportation, buildings, industry, electrification. If we spend an additional trillion, not that much more, by 2025 we'll actually be returning more from our savings in transportation, buildings, and industrial processes, that by 2035, within 25 years, will be cash flow positive. And by 2050, we will actually have returned to the economy $2.5 trillion. And the net present value of those investments in 2050 today is $668 billion. So if you think it's important to become a little bit more in control of our future energy and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80%, it's actually going to pay for itself. And that was sort of a stunning thing that we need to get that message out. 
Now, we can either do that or we can continue to do what we've done for the last 35 years since I was in college and had the first oil crisis. And that is that we, it's estimated by David Green and company that it costs us an average of $135 billion per year in, uh, for the oil dependence on the U.S. economy, which has roughly doubled since I was in college. Now, it's doubled, it's gone down, it's gone up, gone down. It was at the, uh, in the late 70s, we imported about 37 percent. Today we import uh, 58 percent. There are times when it, it went, spiked and went down, so it's not a smooth monotonic function I, as, as illustrated here. But this is a, a serious issue and we need to connect the dots. So the next step is step we'll look at really drilling down and seeing what are the consequences of not moving on an energy policy and doing business as usual with regard to wealth transfer, trade, and job loss. So I'd say just to summarize the key findings of STEP is that uh, it's techno technologically feasible, doesn't require uh, heroics, but it does require pulling on all the five levers, which again is decarbonizing the electrical sector, electrifying the light duty vehicle fleet, biofuels for freight transportation, getting a modern grid and becoming more energy efficient. Some of our takeaways and learning, as I mentioned, is that biomass for uh, liquid fuel, we probably uh, will require that to be focused on more the freight, work trucks, and planes, and not in passenger vehicles. And we need to take a long-term focus. And what I mean by that is that uh, we could go around and substitute and install uh, gas generators in distributed sense and reduce, in the near term, our greenhouse gas emissions. But if then we look at those assets out of 2050, when we really, or 2030 to 2050, when we really need to get that last push to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we will not be able to afford to do carbon capture and sequestration in a distributed sense. We'll need to do that in more of a centralized sense. So it's just too expensive to look at carbon capture. Unless we come up with really interesting ways of carbon reuse, CO2 reuse, then that might be able to be cheap enough to be applied locally as opposed to at a centralized area. So those are some of our, our key takeaways. In terms of evaluation of the costs, uh, net business as usual for the next 15 years would be a trillion dollars, so that's about 70 billion a year. And it takes about 25 years to reach cash flow break even, but out of 2050, again, if we take a long, uh, a long term view, we'll actually be returning um, 2.5 trillion to the economy. I want to say just a few words to, to uh, finish up here about something else that uh, isn't talked about a lot, but something else I'm, I'm quite passionate about, and that is the educational piece. So the Center for Energy Workforce Development uh, has highlighted that the average age of, electri of, of energy workers is about between 48 and 52, which means over the next generation, or the, excuse me, over the next 10 years, half of those will be of retirement age or will retire. And so we're looking at where is our workforce going to come from? And I think that this is particularly scary. Um, let me move that back. I, I don't want to stay on that for too long. Um, because if we think about, we used to be number one in the world in terms of college degrees per capita. Now we're number two. South Korea has just passed us. But if we look at the 25 through 35 demographic, we're not even in the top 10. And if we think about the number of graduates that have engineering degrees, uh, it's about 4.4%. And again, I was saying, this is an Apollo, in my view, an Apollo 13 moment where we need engineering. We need pe a lot of folks to think about things from a systems perspective. It doesn't necessarily mean, and with all due respect, Dean Davis, that we all have to have an engineering ABET accredited degree, but we need to understand engineering and be systems thinkers. And so I applaud some of the things that I heard um, when I was meeting with the RACI leaders because I think that that's definitely the perspective that you're taking with that. Uh, here at Colorado, which is great. So this is a, a, a crisis that has been talked about gathering above the rising storm. And so working with some colleagues, uh, Linda Katehi, Chancellor at UC Davis, and Dr. Laura Stachel from Berkeley, we launched an initiative last summer called CE3, which is uh, Clean Energy and Education Empowerment for Women, trying to encourage women and underrepresented minorities to take science and engineering classes and become technologically uh, literate. So, um, we are also, so that's one strategy. Second strategy is our secretary, Secretary Chu, has been very forward with partnering and collaborating, particularly with uh, China and India, because uh, both in China and India, uh, 
the, the number of coal-fired plants that are being put up, we need to come up with a solution to carbon capture and sequester uh, the um, uh, pollutants from these particular uh, power generating systems. So let me conclude with what we can all do to end up on a positive note. Um, and I think the story is pretty positive. I mean, the story is that we can do this and it's not going to break the bank. By the way, we've done this once before. It's called the Interstate Highway Act of 1956, where we spent 0.46% of our gross domestic product on building the interstate highway system. STEP would only require 0.37% of our gross domestic product if we wanted to achieve that, if we wanted to achieve it. So what can we do? Well, the first thing we can do is if we replace one frequently used incandescent light bulb with a CFL or an LED, just one, we will save enough power to light up two to three million homes. So for the holidays last year, everybody got a CFL from me. Of course, that was sort of like giving, you know, uh, I don't know what the expression is, ice to the, to the Alaskans, but, you know, it's like they already had CFLs. So that wasn't so helpful. But um, if we were to even then go from CFLs to LEDs, you're going from a 100-watt bulb to a 1-watt, then you can power another million homes. So that's quite nice. Uh, if we really watch what our electricity demands are in whatever way we want to do that, and can we truly save 20% of our electricity um, Electrical generation is a, is a couple gigatons, so 20% is going to be a couple hundred million tons. That's significant. My favorite is not only the front-loading washing machine, but if you wash your clothes, and there's a number of students here, so what can I say? If you wash your clothes. <laughs> or when you take them home. If you will buy cold water detergent, we could save 5% of our energy in the country. That's huge zero emission or low emission vehicles. This is a particular electric vehicle. I'm not selling any particular brand. It's only indicative of what is coming. And then finally, if we can put our laptops on sleep mode when we're not using them, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, we would go from 100 watts to 23 watts, and uh, that would be uh, quite, excuse me, actually more than that would go to just a few watts. So that would be also quite significant. If we were to do all these things, alone, we could probably get more than halfway there. So I think that uh, I show this at the end because um, a colleague of mine once said to me that, and you may have heard him, he actually gave a lecture here in Boulder. You know, we noted that if we look at the Earth and if we turn down the lights a little bit, you see a little sort of glow around the Earth, right? And so that's the atmosphere. And so thank you. That was great. Um, <laughs> on command. And, and this, is, this is very fragile, and it's a little bit like the shell of an egg. And I think that the more stuff we put into that atmosphere, the more fragile it becomes. Actually, his words, um, Dr. Hanshi said, you know, it's a little bit like having a car on a hot summer day and rolling up the windows, and our children and grandchildren are trapped inside. Now, I, I say that because I can picture that metaphor. My chief of staff hated it when I'd say that because he says, you, you give this lecture and then you, it, you end on a downer. So let me end back on an upper and just say that if we go back, we can do something about it, all right? So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be glad to take some questions at this time. Well, let's take some questions and you can either cut it off or I'll stand up when okay. it's about time. That was just great. Uh, Dr. Johnson is willing to take some questions. She will call on people from the audience. Uh, I don't know that we have a uh, walk around mic, so uh, please speak uh, loudly. And she will repeat the question because we have an overflow room elsewhere who we need to uh, relate the uh, questions and answers to. Okay, great. Yes, sir. So um, I have two quick questions. One is um, that you mentioned that the, one of the goals was to up the number of electric cars. Yes. And I was curious about why, um, you know, how this would actually help since actually the cars would then be uh, fueled by coal versus gasoline and coal burning uh, produces more CO2 right. uh, per kilowatt hour. Right. The other question is, uh, well, what I can understand the economic gain from the STEP program by efficiency increases, but what about, uh, what would be, uh, an economic incentive or gain from decarbonization. Okay, so it's great. Do I get to choose which question? No, okay. Um, so the first one, I think, is um, I can a answer 
directly. One is that um, remember that our electricity, even now before decarbonizing the electric sector, so you're exactly right, we need to decarbonize the electric sector, then electric cars make sense. But even now, 70%, 30% uh, of our electric sector is from clean, clean energy, non-CO2 energy, all right? So it's nuclear and renewables. So you actually get about a 30% reduction right now, even if you plug it in. And that took me a while to kind of grok myself, but that's helpful. And then the second, so the second question you asked was, uh, I'm getting older. Oh, sorry, about the uh, step program benefiting from decarbonization. All right. So, so this is interesting. I said I was going to make an analogy with a university environment. And so the question is, how does a step uh, benefit from uh, decarbonization? You see it in efficiency. And that's actually a really important point. Imagine you've got these four sectors. Now imagine they're deans of universities. So you've got electrical generation, and we'll call that engineering. And then we have transportation, and we'll call that law. And then we've got industry, and we'll call that medicine, and we've got buildings and residential, and we'll call that arts and sciences. Now, from my perspective, having been a provost and a dean, I have never seen another dean walk over to my office and hand me a check for money. This is not going to happen. Sorry, guys, unless I'm wrong about this, right? So you need an overarching policy. That's, that's a reason for provosts and presidents to exist, right? So you need this policy, and the same with the government. There's no way that the investments we need to make in the generation sector, which are going to lead to benefits in the energy efficiencies, in industry, and in buildings, and transportation. Particularly in transportation, you get the biggest benefit. Because it turns out that the equivalent of running an electric car on gasoline would be a dollar a gallon of gasoline today. So if you were to power your electric car with solar panel, everybody says solar is too expensive. Well, it's too expensive. You're comparing it against coal or hydropower. You're comparing it, in my mind, to the wrong market, the wrong product. Compared to gasoline, it's a third as cheap. It's only a buck a gallon. You can, and, and that's a, so I would say right now that we've got to figure out, that's why the country needs a national policy. Because you're going to have to take the, some of the savings, not all of it, just some, a little tax, and put it towards investing in our generation. And that's what is needed. Yes? Right. So the question was, based on the recent results of the election, what do I think um, is uh, the feasibility of actually doing STEP? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think there are aspects of STEP that are very palatable, actually. So I would say uh, nuclear resonates a lot, particularly in the southeast and in particularly with a particular side of, of the aisle, and actually more so on the other side of the aisle as well. Um, I think that carbon capture sequestration of coal and natural gas plays well on both sides. I think energy efficiency uh, is important as well. Um, you know, I think that it's not a bad thing to think about jobs. And so the way I, when I go up to the Hill and talk to our elected officials, I talk about it in terms of job generation. So uh, I did, I've done some detailed calculations on job generation for nuclear power, because each, each sector is different. So nuclear power is 2.6 jobs per megawatt. So if you install a gigawatt power plant, you're talking about 1,000 times 2.6. You're talking about having two to 3,000 careers. That's not jobs. And I, I calculated careers 30 years long, roughly. So that's just for one plant. If we're going to build 100, that is going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs with a, with a run rate of 30 years. And if we get into the export business, which is actually uh, an interesting opportunity, then we're talking of, of potentially more jobs. I don't like to do numbers so much. I think that's the kind of conversation that we need to be having. It's, and that's why I think the next step of step is to drill down and take those numbers per sector and aggregate them and, uh, and do that in a way. And I think if we can show how it is going to and how it is affecting the economy, I think the thing that I'm most proud about is that we created hundreds of thousands of jobs for America. And that means more to me than anything I've probably done in my career. So I think that's what I, I think it should be palatable to both sides. But um, and that's one of the reasons that I um, thought it would be a good time to go back to the private sector and see the opportunities and try and drive them forward and help the industries drive them forward. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that because I looked at nuclear very, very carefully myself. You know, I uh, could probably call up in my mind in the Navigant study, uh, but I would 
you know, if I was testifying in front of Congress right now, I'd say, can I take that question for the record and get back to you? So I will. But that's a good question. Not sure, because the, the difference is the following. In a nuclear power plant, you've got safety, and you also have ongoing operations, not just the CapEx. So a lot of times what people do is they just talk about the number of jobs created in terms of the capital acquisition and installation. So once you put up a wind turbine, you know, if you have to go back there and mess with it, it's very expensive. So gearbox brakes, that's why we're trying to go to direct drive. Um, you don't want to do that, especially if it's offshore where there's a lot of potential. So my guess would be it's actually less careers than in the nuclear power industry. Uh, okay, how about, I've done a lot here, so how about I'll move over here? Yes. Um, so does the, what, what do we consider when we say 83% uh, in 2050? Is that scope one and scope two? Is that scope one only? Or uh, scope okay. One, scope two, scope three, right. Two yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, so we're talking about 83% of 2005. I should have said what the baseline is. And then um, it's for all CO2. Uh, so I did not include, I, I don't believe, I shouldn't say greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's just focused on CO2. But I also probably should take a QFR on that. Thank you. Good question. Yes, ma'am. It seems that you're depending a lot on carbon capture and sequestration, which is not a proven technology yet. And there is an industry of cleaning up waste yeah. from past mistakes. Yes. And what is your response to that? Is what, what if it doesn't work? Right. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And that's, uh, I'm sorry, state the question again. Uh, the question was, as I understand it, is we're depending on carbon capture and sequestration in terms of utilizing our fossil resources, and what if that doesn't work? Uh, our initial demonstrations, which have been going on for quite a while, do show that they are quite promising. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic it will work. The question is, will it work at cost, where it's affordable? And that's why it's very important that uh, we do a second set of demonstrations and test out oxyburn, uh, post-combustion, pre-combustion. There's like four different IGCC, four different approaches that we're going with right now with coal and natural gas. And so what we want to do in those first set of demonstrations, which will take about five years, which we funded by the Recovery Act, is choose the top two and do a second set of demonstrations, which are going to be expensive. It'll be a billion dollar investment. But by 2020, and I should have mentioned that, we need to be ready to be commercial deployable in carbon capture and sequestration. So um, if it doesn't work, that's why we need a portfolio. And also, there's a, there's a bit of headroom in the renewables and a, in a, well, a bunch of headroom in the renewables and a bunch of headroom in nuclear. And so that's why we need a balance. We haven't really focused on a lot of uh, waste to heat or geothermal. They're producing, actually, um, waste, to, uh, excuse me, waste to electricity is producing uh, the same number of terawatt hours as, um, or more so, actually, than than solar and about the same as wind. So there's still a few tricks in the bag to play with. But it's a good question. About straight back. You said there's a, uh, I have two questions. You said there's a limitation <laughs> on um, the foundry capacity in North America. Is right. there um, an effort being made to reestablish that foundry capacity here? And then second, do you know um, what the current position is on um, India's desire to move to a thorium driven nuclear energy? Right. So the uh, first question was, uh, I said that in North America there's no large foundry that can accommodate building or making, forging the uh, pressure vessel for a nuclear reactor. And are we doing something about that? Um, there are coalitions of companies that are thinking about it. I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I won't mention who because I'll probably get it wrong, but there is that thinking in the U.S. Um, it's, it, they're big. I mean, these are huge things. So they ne tend to need to be located near large rivers or transport places. And uh, it's possible if the demand is there. It's, it's all a chicken and egg, right? You need to have the regulatory approval. It takes a long time to get these uh, permitted and, and built. So it's, it's really balancing that versus the investment. And it's a big investment. And then you, on compounding that, 
price of natural gas has gone down. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. Uh, the comment about India is um, a lengthy one, I, I think, and so maybe we could talk about that uh, afterwards. It's just it's it's complicated, um, as most things are, and I think there's some some treaties and other things that uh, we would like them to participate in as well going forward. So I think we'll get there. Carl? Um, how do you balance the environmental trade-offs, such as water needs or biofuels, um, nuclear waste issues? Are those right. Are those right. And are those some of the top reasons you're thinking of creating as well? Or, um, <laughs> Now, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, b the biofuels is, is very, uh, I've, I have seen calculations done on the amount of water required. I've not done them myself, so they don't stick in my mind. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. I do know that a gallon, uh, a kilowatt hour to produce on average takes about a half of gallon to a gallon of water, right, depending on what technology. So I think that that's something that, that we should, another step of step, maybe that's something you'd want to do, is take the, the portfolio here and then do a trade-off on the water usage. That would be quite interesting. Yeah, that'd be good. Yes? Um, I'd like to know what is the numerical terms of the role of distributed generation that all of this is in the numerical estimate like And secondly, the role of human Uh, in numerical terms, um, okay. So, so uh, I mentioned. So the question was, what are in numerical terms uh, is behavior factored into this? So in the. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. We're counting on human behavior because right now as I, uh, well, I mentioned that we're at about 1.77% energy intensity decrease and we want to increase that to 2.3%. So where is that 0.6% going to come from? I'm not sure what segment of that would be human behavior and what segment of that would be. I would actually guess that the majority would be human behavior because look, our generation plants are very efficient right now. What can we squeeze out of technology? Uh, it depends on. Uh, it depends on how you count human behavior. Uh, I'll give you an example. The, um, one of the success, great successes in um, our building our, in our appliance codes has been refrigeration, right? Where we have doubled the size of refrigeration and cut the energy use in half. Is that a behavior? Is that a feedback? Is that a technology? I mean, it's hard to say what I would, and I'm not a behavioral scientist, how I would define that. Uh, in terms of distributed, so distributed is a really interesting question. Um, it would, distributed energy, what would you define as the unit size numerically on distributed energy? I just wonder, most of what you talked about in the utility scale, right. large scale, right. supply size. So, so distributed, so I mentioned 240 terawatt hours come from small modular reactors, and that would be more distributed. Um, in terms of carbon, in terms of coal and fossil, because we'll have to do carbon capture and sequestration, we're not counting a lot of that being distributed. In fact, we don't want that to be distributed. And then in terms of solar and wind, um, so you know, the optimum size, I would say, for CSP would be about 30 mil, uh, megawatts. And uh, you know, we'll see what two out of five installations in residential are done by either Sunrun or Solar City. So I think that the economic models and the behavior are changing. So in order to have behavior change, it seems to me we've got to solve a pretty simple problem. And that is the people that do the, the capital acquisition aren't the people that operate. And also, the second problem is the upfront capital costs are so expensive that most folks don't put solar panels on their home. And so Solar City and Sunrun have solved that by doing a lease problem and then get, applying for the rebates and being able to afford it. So um, it's an interesting question because I think that uh, also a fun question is, what's the balancing area you need? As you increase wind and solar that are variable, you know, what region do you have to do in terms of balancing with regard to base load? And that question hasn't been answered yet. I know that because I'm interested in maybe studying that. Yes, sir. What is your view of the a recent big increase in uh, natural gas from the shale pines? Well, I think that uh, the price of natural, well, I think one of the, the uh, 
possible responses is the price has gone down so much that it's uh, making merchant nuclear difficult. And I think that um, we, I think we need it for heavy duty freight in the trucks. I think we need it for, uh, as a, we could use it as a coal substitute in centralized coal fired plants. You already see Progress Energy swapping out some of their old coal, more polluting plants with uh, gas. Gas is about 40% um, less carbon intensive. So I think it's quite interesting, particularly in the near term. I think that if we're not successful in figuring out how to reuse the CO2 or, or store it, that's going to be just um, another issue in about 20 years. How about a, a couple last ones? Darn, I thought I was going to get through this. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What would you like to ask? Well, so, you know, the, can't manage well. I, you know, it was in my portfolio, so I, 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 but I don't take it personally. Um, and it's, we do spend a lot. We spend about $6 billion a year on trying to manage the legacy of the Cold War. Uh, so right now, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, has said that dry cast storage of nuclear waste is good for about 300 years, which gives us some time to figure out what to do with it. Now, we, um, we've not been a big fan of recycling because of the plutonium. However, there's a lot of very interesting designs now that continue to use the nuclear um, fuel so that there's less and less of unspent fuel and actually at certain temperatures that can burn up the transuranic waste. So I think we're learning a lot. To be honest, I think that we've not spent near enough money on the R&D of this. So out of six billion, and this is public information, you can look it up in the 2010 budget. The budget for cleanups about six billion, and I think the R&D was 60 million. So it seems to me that that needs to be probably increased to at least 10% because it's a, it's a problem that we can solve, but we need to put our effort into it all our talents into it. We haven't had uh, that perspective. So one of the things that I've been doing is, which I can't comment on the budget because it hasn't come out yet, but let's just say that has not gone unnoticed by myself or the secretary. And we would hope to help that equation in the future. Will you um, choose somebody? I, I just would love to stay and talk all the time, but right. if you don't mind. Thank you very Thank much, you. Christina.